I'm Peter Hollinshead from Dairy Farmer magazine and we're here at the livestock event at the NEC to look at some of the latest technical developments on display. I now want to move on to that ever-present job on farm of foot trimming and to help us with that we're joined today by Reuben Newsom from the vet school at Nottingham University who believes that we may be slightly over trimming these feet Reuben, is that right? Yes that's correct. Um, the piece of work we've done, really, which is published in the veterinary records uh, just a couple of weeks ago, um, is looking at the recommendation for the Dutch method. Um, so it states that we need to trim the claw to 75 millimetres. But we've done some work that just looked at the variation in the minimum trimming length that you can cut a cow's foot to safely, whilst avoiding the soft tissues, the sensitive painful tissues in a foot, and also giving, uh, leaving enough sole thickness. And uh, just the variation means that 75 millimetres is actually not appropriate for uh, most cows. Uh, for many cows, uh, particularly older cows, you need to go longer, you need to leave more space. And that's, that's really up to 90 millimetres. So if, we, uh, if we're, training, we're training new people then, uh, to foot trimming, then why, why use a recommendation of 75 millimetres when it's actually, we know 90 is safe. And then once people are trained, then they can use their experience to go a bit shorter. Now, although Ruben's series is very interesting, I, I want to turn to someone who's a lot of experience in foot trimming on farm, David Rowe from Devon, who's 20 years experience in the job, just to see how practically he thinks of this foot length element. Now, David, you've been at it a long time. Is this nine centimetres about right, do you think? Um, although I agree with a lot of the presentation with Ruben about um, one size doesn't fit all, which was his presentation. I think a nine centimeter measurement is being very cautious, over cautious in my opinion. Um, I think that at more realistically at eight, I would agree with eight probably, because for sure cows are getting bigger. And we were originally taught 7.5, but actually when the method first started, it was actually seven. So it should progress, but I personally think nine would be too much. And, and what are the dangers of leaving it maybe marginally too long? Okay, so for me, um, leaving it too long, if you leave it too long, then you can actually reduce the foot angle. So your foot angle could go, we, we're desiring about 52 degrees. We're not going to get every toe 52 degrees, but by making the toe longer, that actually reduces the foot angle. And if you've got a reduced foot angle, then that can lead to the pedal bone, uh, to the cow going back on her heels, and actually the pedal bone would create more ulcers being back on their heels. They need to be on the toe where the weight should be distributed through the toe. Our next uh, board of call is to look at a calf feeding system, which in fact was so impressive that it uh, won the Livestock Machinery Award at, at this event. And to tell me about it is Alan Dixon from Winstay Earth Group. Thank you very much. Yes, it's a very simple system which allows ad-lib feeding of dairy calves or beef calves, uh, lambs or goats. It basically heats up um, cold milk to blood temperature at the feeding point. So uh, it is basically a water bath which is kept at about 42 degrees and as the milk is drawn through this machine it's warmed up to the right temperature. Now I've heard a lot about robotic milking and now we're on to robotic feeding and this takes the thing one stage further by keeping that feed in front of those cows. To tell us about this device I'm joined by Tim Gibson who's got it on the stand here to tell us all about it. Yeah this is a uh, Wasabo Butler Gold it uh, pushes a feed up to the uh, feed fence on an automated system and uh, the, uh, the machine is completely automated, it runs as many times a day as you wash, as you, as you want. The, um, it's battery powered and it parks itself up in a charging station, charges itself up and runs through a, a program that you uh, predetermine using a, an iPad or an iPhone or an input on the side of the machine with a little touch screen that you can work. So you can control it from your iPhone, can you? You can control it from your phone at the other side of the world. It's All right. completely linked to the internet and that's maybe to one extreme but it's to, to show the capability it can do that. But in general, uh, for, the, uh, for the farmer that's using it every day, you can use the screen on the side to, to, to direct it, 
but he can also change its direction or its course or move it out of the way with his iPhone when he's in his tractor and when he's feeding his cows with his mixer wagon. Now on the very impressive stand of ADF Milking Limited. And to tell us about how things are going here, I'm going to speak to the founder, James Duke. Now James, we're seeing more and more of these typical characteristic um, yellow liners and uh, shells on, on farm. So how's business with you? It's fantastic, Peter. I think uh, more than ever, uh, the focus for efficient farming is on efficient labour utilisation and proactive health for cows uh, to maximise farm profit, especially at the moment. And what you're achieving is this element of automatic dipping and flushing, the ADF bit. I think the secret of our success is the fact that we dip the teat immediately after milking, thereby denying bacteria entering that wide open teat canal due to the negative pressure in the other after milking. And if we can apply that sanitizer, an emollient, immediately milking to finish, we're getting maximum effect, getting the emollient into the pores of the skin, and denying any bacteria on the end of the teeth entering the udder immediately after milking. We're, we're always looking at any way to improve and in fact we're launching this year a new, new dual injection technology. Uh, traditionally we've always injected at one angle for both the teeth dip and the sanitation of the liner but by incorporating a very novel gravity operated valve we can now achieve even better teat coverage with up to 20% less teat dip. So very economical use of the teat dip and yet awesome teat coverage. And still, still combined with very effective flushing. Now calf rearing is an often neglected uh, job on the farm but we're getting a lot more attention these days because we need to get these, cal these calves growing faster and calving early for two years of calving and the paybacks on that are quite large and worth having. Now Neil, why do we need to achieve these growth rates? Afternoon Peter. Um, what's really important is the production animal is the engine room of a dairy enterprise, we all know that. What we, what we tend to forget about is the journey towards the production animal is absolutely critical to the quality of the production animal that you get. So age at first calving is a measure of rearing efficiency and depending on when you carve down really does drive the quality of the production animal that you achieve. For example, carving down at 24 months, which is the optimal time to carve down, will generate a product, an animal that is 40% more efficient in terms of yield, longevity and, um, and fertility compared to an animal that's carving down at 30 months, which is very close to where the national average is now, which is around 29 months. Calf development and the growth of the calf really does set that animal up for the rest of its life. We have feed conversion efficiencies higher at any other time in the animal's life and it's a fantastic time to really get that calf off to the right start. We know that there are fundamental developments happening within the animal in terms of mammary gland development, epigenetics and metabolic programming. So it really is short-sighted if we don't invest in that phase of time. And what we're asking our farmers to do is to look at doubling the birth weight of that animal by weaning, which is roughly around 56 days, as an absolute minimum target. Long last, we seem to have some good results in the dairy industry. And goodness knows just now we could do with them. And that's coming from the thousand plus samples of first cut grass silage they've done at Trow Nutrition. And to take us through the figures, I'm joined by Adam Clay, uh, who, will, who will tell us what this diet is worth in due course. OK, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, broadly speaking, we have got a good quality first cuts um, come through this season so far. We've got over a thousand samples, which is really what we need to be able to determine whether we've got a good quality first cut uh, coming through. We started off well because we had some hard frosts leading in March and April time, which stunted grass growth. So that slowed it down, so it meant that at first cut, we had quite a young and immature and leafier crop, and maybe lower on yield. So what that's resulted in the analysis is that dry matters are slightly higher. So a slightly hi a higher dry matter should help with structure in the diet, and therefore creating rumen structure and a rumen mat to help to stabilize rumen function. So that's certainly a positive. And as I go down different areas of the analysis as well, 
we've got higher proteins. Now that's good to be balanced with, but if I link the higher proteins with also a higher sugars and a stable room as a stable silage pH at 3.9 pH, that indicates good clamp stability. So we should have reduced losses within the clamp and hopefully reduced losses when it's mixed up into a TMR as we go out into the feed fence as well. So that's certainly another strong positive. But the ME is up about 0.2, 0 0.2 units, is. isn't it? Which is worth, I believe, about two two megajoules, which is maybe half a litre of milk. Yeah, so there yeah, is that potential yeah, there yeah, to get more yeah. milk from this. Oh, this it is side. certainly. It is certainly. We've seen a higher digestibility and a higher ME. So average ME on the first cuts now is 10.9 ME in relation to a 10.7 ME last year. So energy density is very is is a lot better in this season. That's linked with a lower fibre as well. So generally on a smaller crop and a leafier crop we get lower NDF, lower fibre but by contrast we get a higher digestibility and a higher ME. So that's giving us a roughly about a 0.4 litre per head per day increase based on a standard 10 kilograms of dry matter intake of that silage.